congratulations on, on Delirious. Well, you. You, you, you had it uh, uh, released before, but congratulations on the director's cut. Of Thank it. you, man. It, uh, it's a very significant thing. And, uh, you know, we can wait until you start, and unless you want to start now. Whatever, no, no, whatever. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's just a kind of an intuitive thing, and, and I, I know I'm not the only one uh, in the arts who feels this way, but, but uh, there is really something to be said for having it be the way you intended it. And, and I'm, I'm not talking about uh, an egotistical or, or, you know, personal vanity thing. It's like, you know, I've learned after nine or ten films that, you know, there's ways to change it. And, and, and you can't be too precious about whatever you've done. But I've also gotten an, an objectivity about my films. And, and uh, I knew that the change that was forced upon me 14 years ago was wrong. <laughs> I knew it. And uh, it's taken me this long, many, many sleepless nights since then, you know, to, to find the person that ended up having the rights to the film and, and negotiating a deal with them. I actually bought the Blu-ray rights myself. Did you know that? No, I did not know that. Could you, could yeah. you tell about the, this uh, journey? Because obviously it's a 14 year old journey with yeah. you. When, when did you decide that you wanted to get these rights back? Well, I started trying to uh, literally the week after the film opened in New York, you know, because I knew that the ending was wrong. Um, you, did, did you see the, the director's cut? I, I did not see the director's cut. I saw the original's cut. Okay. Well, you know, when you can, you, sh you should check out the director's cut and see the difference because uh, there's, there was a scene uh, missing from the end that I put back. And it had to do with Steve Buscemi's character who, who struggles throughout the entire film. And it was written that he has a moment, a tiny moment of recognition. And we shot the scene and everything, but the producer said, no, 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 you know, and, and they just, I don't know why I listened to them. But anyway, I said, okay, guys, you release the film theatrically. Let's, when the DVD comes up, this was going to be like around 2007, let me at least change it for the DVD. They said no. Then that company went bankrupt. And I couldn't get anybody on the phone. They literally just disappeared. And, and, and I kept trying, and nobody would answer the phone. A year went by, two years. And it was the, the scariest thing, Gabe, because not only... I couldn't reach them, but I had no idea where the film was, where the negative was, where where any elements of the film. Uh, um, I kept looking, and I would lay awake at night, just agonizing, thinking, I screwed up the ending of my film, and it's going to be that way for eternity. You know, I could not accept that. <laughs> uh, although I didn't know what the solution was, um, I moved to California about three years ago. Uh, uh, was at a, a dinner party. I actually met this one guy who was a, a, a film producer and he says, I know who picked up the rights to, to Delirious after it went bankrupt. He gave me the guy's number. I couldn't believe it. I called him and he said, yeah, yeah, I have the rights. Uh, I have to tell you though that everything else about the film has disappeared. There's no prints. There's no negative. There's nothing. The only thing that exists is this high-res digital master on my hard drive. And I said, uh, do you want to release it as a director's cut on Blu-ray? He goes, no. <laughs> he said, but the rights are available. And I said, okay, how much? You know? And uh, it was a good price. And I said, well, let me do it. And I bought the rights to the film myself. Uh, immediately put the film back together the way it was when I had done it. And, and uh, arranged to get a deal. And... and you know, there it is. The film is back together the way I intended. So was the change, was just the ending, or was there other little changes uh, throughout the entire movie that you also had to add in? for the There was a couple little changes, but primarily it was the ending. Uh, it was, a, it was, it's just a massive shift in the tone of the film. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't know whether you remember, but the, the, the film ends right now with, uh, Buscemi's character, well, I don't want to give it away for people, but uh, because it's, you know, it's a real cliffhanger. I mean, you know, you, 
you you kind of think that he's so desperate at, at this moment at the end of the film that he might actually you know do something very destructive and um but anyway yes it's the ending of the film and to me it just brings it right back to the way to where the film started and uh you know it's buscemi's film really i mean michael pitt is amazing and everybody is, is incredible uh but it is a part of a lifetime for buscemi and you know gig i wrote the thing for him and at first and i was so excited about it you know and i sent it to him you know and he goes uh, i didn't hear from him <laughs> two weeks run by and finally i ran into him and i said steve did you get the script and he goes yeah i got it uh i'm not gonna do it i said what are you talking about and it took from that point that was about a year and a half later i finally got him to say I see it now. I see what you're doing. And, uh, you know, he just, and so, and so it's a long way of saying that he has the final scene at the end of the film, which gives his character just a little hint of redemption. And I felt that he earned it. What do you think about the timing? Because uh, we're talking about a movie that's nearly a decade and a half ago. And, uh, and there are certain scenes where they're still using, you know, like Nokia phones or uh, <laughs> old telephone booths or telephones in their homes. And I, yes. I mean, young, younger generations may not even, can't even relate to something like this anymore. Right. Well, I, I don't think we have dial uh, rotary phones, gig. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's a couple of, yeah, listen, I mean, technology changes so fast. Uh, 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 you know, especially the whole whole idea of, of of taking a photo digitally and and emailing it around the world literally in seconds. You know that 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 was a new phenomenon which which I had Steve's character uh, really excited about. You know, well that's old hat right now. But but I think the fascination with celebrity and uh, the paparazzi and you know that weird balance between love and hate of of yeah you know they they need to do their job. But where where is the line between that and the violation of privacy? Uh, uh, also, you know, the, the film is it really a study on on what fame does to people, and uh, I think that is universal and and still is relevant today. Because what I find, and, I, and this could be a massive generalization, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, <laughs> I think that this desire, this craving for fame at any cost uh, comes from an inner sense of no value. Because if you had your own sense of value, it wouldn't be so desperate to have other people or, or even the entire world tell you that you're great. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, you're talking uh, about validation, yeah. Yes, and it's just become a universal sort of like uh, uh, disease that, that no one can feel good about themselves unless they have, you know, 15 million likes. Uh, it's, it's really kind of, tr you know, troubling. And, uh, and so I wanted to try to, to set the film up in that, in that Les, Steve Buscemi's character, Les Galatine, is basically at the bottom rung of the celebrity ladder. He's, he's one of the most, you know, the, the, the paparazzi is, is in general kind of, you know, down, down at the bottom, you know, and, 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 and I, I, I was interested in his own sense of self value mm -hmm. and several scenes in there as to like, he's still looking for it at his age from his father, you know, uh, and his father just treats him terribly. And you could see how that kind of crippled him in a way. Uh, but yeah, I think that it's still relevant and uh, even more so. Uh, we just, you know, there are people that, and that's why I put the character of, of Toby in there, Michael Pitt. Mm -hmm. I love the whole idea of the fascination with the star. There are people that are true stars. I really believe that. And that's what keeps us all going in this business. You know, uh, uh, we, we as, as, as the cinema audience, I love looking at a screen and seeing somebody's persona just, you know, be so enormous that it, it blows you away. And I, I think it's valid. Yeah. Sometimes I, after watching your film, sometimes I feel 
a red carpet event like that, which I last time I covered was six months ago. It feels like a whole lifetime ago. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Um, I wonder how it's going to get. You know, listen. All, all you, all we can do is 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 trust and assume that that they will find a cure for this awful, awful virus, and uh, and uh, things will at least get back to people being able to do what they normally do. You know. The virus that I'm most concerned about <laughs> has to do with the guy in the White House. <laughs> so uh, did you reach out to the rest of the cast members to let them know on the good news on that this is this yeah. film is being re-released? -re yes. I mean, they, they were all excited about it, especially Steve and Gina. Uh, uh, you know, it's... When, when I make a film, I like to try to include the people that... that uh, come to it uh, with a personal investment. Now, again, it's not be, that they have an investment to me or whatever, but but they they bring that not only their art, but they they bring something else to it. And uh, you know, we all felt like we had accomplished something pretty pretty phenomenal with this film. We shot it in 30 days in New York City. You know. Uh, uh, no reshoots, just, and, and it, it was just a massive uh, endeavor. And, and so I think Gina and Steve are really proud of the film and, and both were uh, thrilled to see that I had put it back to the original cut. Excellent. And yeah. um, is there any other extra features that you'll be featuring on this, uh, this Blu-ray director's cut? I believe you yeah. have to do a commentary. I did a brand new commentary. Which, which was really, those things are really tough to do. Okay? I mean, you know, usually the way you do them is, oh, I guess maybe two, a month before the, or two months before the DVD comes out, you go to a studio, uh, a technician puts a microphone in front of you, they project the film silently. And you just talk. And what the studio time is expensive, so they don't want you to stop. <laughs> they don't want you to, to, to redo you know, That's right. and so in, I, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with it because a lot of times what comes out is just kind of stupid. It's, you know, it doesn't, because you're trying to look at the screen and talk about what's happening on the screen. And then, so in this case, what I did was uh, I sat here in my own, in my own place and I recorded it uh, scene by scene. And and really had a very conscious thought about what I wanted, let's say the first 10 minutes of the commentary to be. And I, cause I said, listen, if someone's gonna listen to this, I want them to get something out of it, you know? And so I completely redid the commentary. And I, I think it really turned out well. Uh, I, and that's on the Blu-ray. Um, I shot a small uh, film introduction talking about the story that I just told you in a slightly condensed version, you know, of how I got the rights, what prompted me to, to want to do this, you know, and uh, there is a full length uh, music video of the song that Alison Lohman sings, which is really, we did, we shot a music video for the film and that turned out really hilarious. Uh, and there are these three fake, <laughs> promo shots that we did after the first release because I could tell the distributors were not going to spend a dime uh, for publicity. So I came up with this concept of like doing these, these fake moments, uh, one in which I, I, I crashed a press conference that Steve Buscemi was giving. I really did. I brought a camera. Uh, he was in on it. Mm -hmm. He was in on it and totally into it. And so I had a cameraman and me and we crashed this press conference and talking to him, you know, and then I find we started going, so, so I said, Steve, so what's the deal? How come you're not doing press for, you can do this press, but you're not doing press for, for Delirious, you know? And we get into a really intense argument, <laughs> but it's totally fake. It's totally fake. And uh, the same thing with Gina, Gina Gershaw, we did one where I just told her, uh, come to this hotel room. I rented a hotel room in Manhattan and I had a, a camera crew there. And she thought she was going to come and do publicity. And the camera crew thought that they were going to shoot a kind of a, a softcore porn piece with Gina. 
And again, it was just what's so fantastic about Gina is that she didn't really know that and she just went with it. It was completely improvised, except I had set the pieces in motion. And, uh, and so that, that became our, our own personal sort of promotion for the film. Uh, that one turned out wonderful. You should see that one. You know what? Now I'm very curious about it. I'm going to have to get a, try to get a copy of your uh, <laughs> a Blu-ray, mo most definitely. You well, should. I'm, I'm surprised I didn't get you one. Well, not not at this time, but uh, okay. but I, I did I did check out your film, I, and I thought it was uh, delightfully funny. So it's it's terrific. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you well, so, anyways, hey, um, thank thank you, Tom. But before I I let you go, you know, because uh, because of the crazy times that we're actually experiencing, how how are you staying sane and creative uh, for yourself now these days? Well, well, this was this project was definitely crucial for that. I mean. You know, if it hadn't been for this time that I had on my hands, you know, I, I probably would not have been able to, to really focus on this as much as I did. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to be creative in, in what I, you know, in the ways that I can. I, I just wrote and recorded a, a new album of music of all my original stuff, and, and that's going to come out. So uh, um, it's creativity really, really helps, you know. Uh, that's the only thing I can do. I always feel the best when somehow every day, I've, I've created something, whatever it is. And it is a tough time. It's a tough time. If you, if you allow your brain to think about what's really going on, you can, it, it can freak you out, you know, uh, uh, especially politically. And uh, uh, I just, you know, I hope I – can I tell you one thing just quickly? Yeah, go quickly. for it. I was on the phone the other day to, to, to somebody uh, – that I was dealing with, with so about some finances. And he happened to live in North Carolina. And we had a wonderful conversation. And very, he, at the very end, he asked me, so how are things in California? And I said, they're good. I, I must say that it is deeply distressing to, uh, to see that, that, that our country does not have a unified national plan to protect its citizens from the virus. He hung up on me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is how intense it is. What did I say? Did I criticize the president? Did I do? All I said was, hey, we all, wouldn't it be great if, if American citizens all came together and solved this together? You know? Mm -hmm. That's how great. That, that bothers me more than the virus. Man. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good to talk to you. Well, hey, thank thank you, Tom, and um, I, I wish you luck. Um, can't wait to see what your next project is. All right, thank you, Gabe. Hey, thank hey, you. Stay Bye. safe.